Go ahead and have a seat. I hope you, I know you believe what you're just saying, that His mercy is more, and so I hope you're inviting people to come and be a part of what God is doing here in this place uh, as He touches lives. So please keep that on your heart. Keep that on the forefront of your mind to invite people to come and be a part. Uh, we're preaching through the Bible chronologically, and we're looking at characters of the Bible. And in our Bible study classes, if you're a guest, we're teaching through our Bible chronologically this year. The Bible study classes are a little bit of where we are in the preaching schedule. And so let me do just a, just a real quick reminder. In, in Bible study this morning, uh, you were in the period of the kingdom. We're still in the judges in our preaching. So let me remind you about the period of the judges. Look at this. You probably had this in your Bible study class a few weeks ago. But remember during the period of judges, the sin cycle that was going on, there would be peace in the land. The people have inherited the land. There'd be peace in the land as long as they walked with God and walked in obedience with Him. But then they would do evil in the sight of God. And then the cycle would begin. God would punish them. He would discipline them with, through some other nation. And then they would cry out to God. And then God would raise up a judge. And when we say a judge, not a judge like you and I think of judges, but more like a deliverer. Someone who would come and deliver them from this captivity, this other nation. And then God would deliver them. And then there would be peace in the land again. And so to this morning, we're going to look at another of these judges. It's in uh, Judges chapter 13. In fact, his story is told in chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. He's a judge by the name of Samson. Let me give you just a little bit of background that chapter 13 covers. Samson was born into a godly home. In fact, the birth, listen to the birth announcement for Samson. An angel of the Lord came to his mom and said this, the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman, that's Samson's mother, and said to her, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now that sounds a little bit like another birth announcement in scripture, doesn't it? When Jesus was born, and this boy, his father prayed for him before he was born that they'd know how to raise him. And we're told in verse 5 of chapter 13 that he was to be a Nazarite from his birth. Now, what does that mean? For, first of all, to be a Nazarite means he was set apart for God. So bef from before the time he was born, from the time he's born, Samson is set apart for God. Now, a Nazarite meant that three things for him. Number one, no strong drink. He could never have strong drink. Number two, he couldn't go any, near, near any dead bodies. And the third thing was he was to never cut his hair. That was three things he was to do as a Nazarite. So he's set apart from birth, and then God blesses him. In verse 24, it says, the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And then in verse 25, it tells us the Spirit of God moved in his life. So picture this young man set apart from birth as a Nazarite, set apart by God for God. God blesses him as he grows, and God's Spirit is on him. And so this man, Samson, who's set apart from birth to deliver Israel, but to begin the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines, instead of putting himself under God's will and God's plan for his life, instead began to do things his own way. He did that by, and I'll just use this expression, he toyed with sin. He pretty much toyed with sin his entire life. Every chapter after, ch after chapter 13 begins with his eyes on a woman. Uh, one writer I read said of him, he, and if you know he's strong, this writer said he's a he-man with a she-weakness. That's very true of him. He's not the only person walking the planet that's true of. Here's what chapter 14 says. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. And his parents said what every good Jewish couple would say to their son, can't you find a good Jewish girl close to home and not go marry this Philistine girl? And that really is what they said to her. And here's how he responded, get her for me, for she looks good to me. And so right from the start, you see his problem. The man that's set apart from God from birth is more interested in his own pleasure than he is in living a life that brings God pleasure. And, and so the next chapter in chapter 14, they're kind of got his wedding set up with this girl from Timnah, and the whole thing pretty much falls apart. And as it does, Samson should have learned, he should have seen this, but he didn't, that he's not nearly as wise and cunning and cute as he thinks he is. And then chapter 15, so the wedding kind of falls apart, and then chapter 15 begins, and he goes back to try to consummate the marriage with this woman. And it, verse 1 says, Samson, this, listen to this, you cannot make this up. Samson visited his wife with a young goat and said, I will go into my wife in her room, but her father did not let him enter. 
Her father said, I really thought you hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Now, now get the picture of what happens here. Samson goes back now to try to make this marriage work that fell apart in chapter 14. And he shows up and he says, hey, babe, I brought you a goat. <laughs> Let's go ahead and consummate this marriage now. Today it'd be like saying, hey, babe, I, I brought you a ninja bullet so we can make some smoothies. Let's go ahead and consummate this marriage. I mean, it's just crazy. And that's the picture. And the dad says, no, no, I've given her to somebody else. I've given her to your companion. And that didn't set too well with the he-man with the she-weakness. And Scripture says, you know what he does? He goes out and he finds 300 foxes and he ties them together, tails together in pairs of 150. So two fox tails tied together, puts a torch between them and lights the torch. Now you can imagine what the foxes did. And, and, and Scripture says when he lights them, he lit the torches. He bur it says he burned all their grain and destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. So he just, all the Philistine stuff is just like burned up with these 150 pair of foxes running everywhere, burning up all this stuff. And those Philistines are not happy. And they find out what makes Samson so mad. Remember, he's to deliver Israel from the Philistines. They find out what makes him so mad. And so they go and they kill the girl that he was to marry and her father. And now he's really not happy. And there's all kind of friction between the Philistines and Samson and the people. Now, look what happens. Now, understand the verse I'm about to read you are Samson's own people, the Israelites that are about to do this to him now. Listen, it says in verse 11, so 3,000 men of Judah, that's his people, 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson. They said to Samson, don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? Here's the problem. They don't want to deliver. They don't want Samson rocking the boat. They don't want him to come and cause problems. Why? Because they've so infiltrated with this culture They've meshed with the culture so much, and they've intermarried and done all these things. They don't want Samson causing problems. They're pretty content. They're not following their Lord. They're just doing their thing in this culture with the Philistines. And they've meshed so much. That's awfully easy for us to do, isn't it? Just to mesh with culture and go along with people all around us without regard for what God's truth says. Samson replies, he said, hey, look, I just did to them what they did to me. You know, they killed her, they killed him. And so he does all this great destruction. And this is what the men of Judah said. The men of Judah said, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson says to them, okay, I will let you tie me up and hand me over to them if you promise not to kill me yourselves. Now, Samson has a plan. And they said, okay, we'll tie you up and we'll hand you over, but we won't kill you ourselves. Verse 14 says, Samson arrived, the Philistines came shouting in triumph. The Philistines are all excited. They've got Samson now. And Scripture says, but the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, and he just snapped the ropes, and he found the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. This is a strong man. And the Spirit of God has come on him, and he begins to deliver by killing these thousand Philistines. Verse 20 of chapter 15 says, he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Then we come to verse 16, or chapter 16, and now there's another woman. We just have a little glimpse of her. I'll just read it to you so you hear the story. Now Samson went to Gaza, saw a harlot there, and he was with this harlot. And in the night, the people of the city find out he's there, and the men of the city of Gaza surround him, and they say, let's wait till morning, and when he comes out in the morning, we'll kill him. And Samson kind of knows what's going on. He waits around till about midnight, and I love this. He goes out, and it says, while those guys are waiting on him till morning, they're sleeping. He literally picks up the gate to their city, just rips it right out of the ground, posts and all, and carries it to the top of a mountain and leaves their city defenseless. Is that great? This dude's strong. And, and, and he walks away with their gate. So that leads us to the, 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 probably the most famous part of his, of his life. It is the story of the third woman in his life that we hear about. It is the story of Samson and... It's pretty good. Samson and Delilah begins in verse 4. Now, there's a whole lot of ways I can tell you the story, and I, I, I wanna, this is where I want to spend the bulk of our time this morning. But before you hear what I say about him, remember a few years ago we had a comedian here uh, in this room, and he did a great job. His name is Tim Hawkins. I want you to hear Tim Hawkins' take on the story of Samson and Delilah. Watch this. <laughs> Delilah, the 
this is your ex-boyfriend, Samson. And I know you thought that lifting weights made me so buff and handsome, you were wrong. It's cause I let my hair grow long, that makes me strong. Hey there, Delilah, you came in while I was sleeping and I couldn't feel you cutting and I didn't hear you creeping out the door. You left my hair piled on the floor while I just snore. Oh, what you did to me oh, while I was asleep. Oh, I'm a Nazarene, oh, but you shaved me clean. Delilah, you're so mean. I killed a lion, big and mean, and slaughtered many Philistines, all with a donkey's jawbone. That's no lie. But now I'm chained up to the wall, and I can't cry no tears at all because they came and gouged out both my eyes. <laughs> This is a Bible story, boy. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> Why'd you grab your clipping shears and shave my head like Britney Spears? And now I'm standing here in total shame. You're to blame. People, that's stinking genius. What's wrong with you? Come on! Why did you have to deceive me? And it's hard for me to think not long ago I wanted you to be my bride But you took too much off the side <laughs> There we go Hey there Delilah when you die Just tell the devil I said hi <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he got part of it right. <laughs> he didn't get all of it right, but he got a lot of it right. What really happened in the story of Samson and Delilah? What do we learn from it? it, it listen, it's a story of love and lies and loss. First, it's a story of love. Listen, verse 4. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So, so this love story, first of all, Samson loved Delilah. This is the third woman that we know of. Now, there could have been more, but this is the third woman that Scripture tells us uh, that he was with. The problem is this man of God was attracted to women he shouldn't be building his life around. These were all Philistine women. Uh, Samson had an attraction for women who should have been off limits. But ev evidently, it, it, it seems he really loved Delilah when you get to verse 17 and read it. Perhaps he really loved her. But that doesn't excuse the sin in his life that he loved her. It just doesn't. So Samson loved Delilah, but Delilah loved money. The rulers of the Philistines come to Delilah and offer her 1,100 pieces of silver each. Now, if you go read Judges chapter 3, um, there are, it refers to five lords of the Philistines. So let's assume that's right, and if there's five of them, that's 5,500 pieces of silver. They offer Delilah. If the, she'll get the secret to his life and his strength so they can secure him and do away with him. And, and so they want her, the words entice, they want her to kind of play dumb, if you will, and trick him to tell her the truth so they can do these things to him. So it's a love story. It's a story of him loving her and her loving money. It's a story of lies. So, so I'm assuming she uses her most seductive, sweetest Philistine voice. And she says to him, Oh, Sammy Pooh, you are so strong. Look at those biceps. What's the secret? What, Sammy, suppose, Sammy Poo, suppose a girl wanted to know what made you so strong, how she could tie you up so you, oh, maybe so she could afflict you or maybe sell you to somebody. What would you tell her? I know that's pretty weak. So here's the lies. Samson's lies are just stupid. 
He says to her, when she says this, she says, tell me what makes you strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Why would someone ask that? He says, here's what you do. You take seven bowstrings that have never been dried out, tie me up with those, and that'll do it. And so she tries it. They give her the bowstrings. She ties him up. Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up and just snaps the ropes. No problem. Or those strings, no problem. And she says, you're making fun of me. Tell me the truth. And he says, well, you use new ropes. Tie me up with new ropes that have never been used. That'll do it. And she does it. She ties him up with new ropes. Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up and just snaps the ropes. No problem. She's not happy again. And she says, come on, Samson, you're making fun of me, telling me lies. Tell me what can tie you up securely. And this time he says, if you, weaved, if you were to weave my, the seven braids of my hair into the fabric of your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. And so she does it. She gets him asleep and she weaves his hair into the loom and tightens it up and ties up. Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up and just rips it out. No problem. Three times. How dumb can a guy be? Seriously. I mean, don't answer that. It's rhetorical, but you know what I mean. I mean, you want to, don't you want him to say, dude, what are you thinking? The reality is, though, if you look at his response to her, by the time he gets to this third lie to her, he's getting dangerously close to the truth. That's the picture. And while his lies are stupid, her lies are sinister. Then Delilah pouted, how can you tell me I love you? When you don't share your heart, you don't share your secrets with me. You've made fun of me these three times. Sounds like the start of a country western song. You've made fun of me these three times. And you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick of it. And while Samson thinks he's doing pretty good telling her these lies, she's just pulling him right into the trap like a spider with a fly. And she plays the if you really love me card. Samson, if you really love me. And the Bible implies she begged and pleaded day after day after day. Samson should have known what Scripture says. You know what Scripture says? It says it's better to live in the corner of the roof than it is to live in a house with a contentious woman. It also says living with a contentious woman is like living in a house on a rainy day where the water just drip, drip, drip. Women, I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. It really is. It's there. But it's the truth, and he should have known it. What he, honestly, what he really should have done, he should have done, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about Joseph. He should have taken a page from Joseph's life, and he should have run. Remember Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife? That's exactly what he should have done, but he didn't do it. And there were serious consequences. So it's also, it's not just a story of love and a story of lies. It's a story of loss. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed. Listen, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. And Scripture says she realizes he had finally told his heart to her. And when she realizes it, she sends for the lords of the Philistines, and they come, it says they show up with their money in their hands. They bring her the 5,500 pieces of silver. And Scripture says she lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. And then she called for one of the men to come and to shave the seven locks of his hair. And this is how she, Scripture says, in this way she began to bring him down and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. Now what's Delilah's loss in this thing? Here's Samson, who's a man of God set apart from birth to deliver the Philistines. And here's a guy that should have been sharing the truth of God and the law of God and the, and the love of God with the world all around him, delivering his people. But instead, he ruins his testimony with Delilah by the way he lives with her and the way he acts with her. And she may have enjoyed the fruit of her 5,500 pieces of silver for a season, but I suspect Tim Hawkins is right when he said to her, tell the devil I said hi. Her loss is great. What about Samson's loss? Listen, listen to what happens when the Philistines come. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison.
What did he lose? First, he lost his freedom. He's no longer free to come and go as he always was. He lost his vision. They gouged out his eyes. That was the way they could control him. Now they've got control of Samson after gouging his eyes out. He lost, by the way, more than just his physical vision. He lost his dignity. The first time he went to Gaza, it was for pleasure when he went there to see the harlot. This time he goes back and the Philistines put him in their prison and they force him to grind. What that means is he was walking in circles, grind and grain, just constantly. That would have been the job of the lowest slave or even, even the job of an animal. They so humiliated him, the, the one that was to be the mighty judge, the mighty deliverer of Israel, has been so humiliated, he's into this forced labor of a slave. All these things that happened in his life are the picture of sin's power in our lives and what sin will do to us. Sin will wear you out and it will waste your life. Now I say that, we're in church this morning and we all expect to hear something about sin and what sin will do to your life. But don't let that just pass by you. That's a reality. That's what sin will do. It will waste your life. And Samson's learning that. Remember, he's a Nazarite, spiritually set aside for God. And Samson's hair was just the external symbol of that commitment. His strength wasn't in his hair. It was in his being set apart for God. His strength came from God. But that was the symbol. And the picture is here, he lost his fellowship with God. Verse 20 says, the Lord had left him. He crossed the line he should not have crossed when he allows his hair to be cut. And God backs away from his life and he loses his strength. And the next line is just more, more damaging than that, I think. He lost his spiritual discernment. It says, but he didn't realize the Lord had left him. When Samson wakes up, he says, I'll shake myself free. I'll bust the binds of this just like I have every other time. But he can't do it because the Lord has left him and he doesn't even know it. He's not even aware that the presence of God is gone from his life. He had gotten so used to doing life on his own in his own strength, doing things his own way. He didn't realize the presence of God was gone. Let me ask you a question today. If the presence of God left your life, would you know it? Would you know it? Do you live your life in such a way that his presence is irrelevant? Would you know if his presence left you? He also lost his ministry because of his sin. He no longer was going to be the judge of Israel. That was about to come to an end. And he lost his testimony. He was humiliated in the eyes of the enemy. And when they laughed at Samson, they were laughing at his God. That they were giving their God, Dagon, credit. The Philistines were credit. Their God defeated the living God of Israel. And they're rejoicing and celebrating and worshiping their God because of the defeat and humiliation of Samson. Now, even though this story is tragic, and it is, it has another component that we can't miss. Listen, listen to this. It's also a story of restoration. We all fail, all of us, starting with me. We all fail, and sometimes we fail in a very big way, like Samson did. If we, if we keep on with a life of sin, just steady, 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 the presence of God will pull back from our life just like it did in Samson's life. But don't miss what happens. When his eyes are gouged out and he's there in prison, in that Philistine prison, something begins to happen. And the next verse is probably the most important verse for you and me this morning in the whole story. It's verse 22. It says this, but before long, his hair began to grow back. His hair begins to grow back. He's there in that prison. He's alone. He can't see. He's just walking in circles, grinding grain all day. And his heart turns, begins to turn back to God. And he begins to repent. And he begins to see again. Maybe he can't see physically anymore, but he begins to see the truth again. And as he repents, it says his hair begins to grow again. They bring him out. They have a big celebration to their god, Dagon, the Philistines do. Thousands of people are there, scriptures. There's 3,000 on the roof alone. We don't know how many are there total. 
And they bring Samson out to make sport of him, for him to be the entertainment. So here comes the strong man of Israel. Their deliverer is brought out to entertain them. And whatever he does to entertain them, he does. But when he's there and they're honoring their God, Dagon, over the living God, and Samson prays. If you read the, go read chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. Samson doesn't pray very often. But he's repentant now, and he prays. And he says, God, will you give me strength one more time? One more time, give me strength. And he prays that, and he also prays, and let me die with the Philistines. And the young man is leading him, and he asks the young man to show him where the pillars are. And you know the story. He puts his hand on one pillar and his other hand on the other. And while they're all making a ruckus and worshiping their god, Dagon, God comes on him and gives him his strength, and he pushes the columns, and the place collapses. And Scripture says that Samson killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. He did more to deliver Israel that day, that one time in his death, than his whole life prior to that. Here's, here's the picture, if you will. In his brokenness, Samson began to learn what real strength was. He'd been a strong guy. But in his brokenness, he learned real strength. Like Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. And he began to see it. When we're repentant and there is humility, then there's strength. That's the picture. Listen, I don't know where you are today. I'm in a room this size, I'm sure there are some people that feel a little bit like Samson did when he was in prison with his eyes gouged out. But the reality is, if you will be truly repentant and turn to God, he will never abandon you completely. He may back away from you for a season because of the sin of your life, but if you will turn your heart back to him, if you've been set apart for him and you know him and you turn your heart back to him, he's not abandoned you forever. And he will come to you and renew that relationship. How did this happen to Samson? How did he come to this point in his life? Here, here, a man set apart for God from his birth. How did it happen? I'll tell you where it began. It began that day when he said to his parents, get her for me. She looks good to me. And, and, and in a sense, he was just saying, this is one small step. He didn't, you, th you think Samson saw, saw in that first step, you think he saw all the way down the road to a day when he'd have his out, eyes gouged out and be in prison because of the sin of his life? He didn't see that. It was one step and a bunch of steps that led to there for his life. He said, I want that, when he knew it was a that he shouldn't have. Here's a question for you today and for me. Is there an I want that in my life? What's the I want that that I shouldn't be desiring? What's the I want that that you shouldn't be desiring? Now, here's the real problem with him. You know, the real problem with him was when he said, I want that, he thought to himself, I can handle that. It's not that big a deal. I can handle that. I'm a strong dude. I want that. I can handle it. But he couldn't. And neither can you. And neither can I. I know it's wrong. I know God's Word says it's wrong, but I want that, and I can handle that. And it will be a step down the path, just like in Samson, to where we become captive to that thing. God's presence left him. So, so what do we learn from Samson? Let me just close it with this. What, what do we learn from the life of Samson? What do you learn from his life? What can I learn from his life? Listen, if you know Christ today, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you know him, you're to be set apart for him. You're to be set apart for Christ just like Samson was set apart as a Nazarite from birth. And we're set apart from him. And here's the first thing we need to know. When we choose to bring ourselves pleasure over to live our lives in such a way that it brings God's pleasure, there will always be consequences. There just will be. It's a fact. When we say, I want that, knowing it's a that we shouldn't have, and I can handle it, we're in trouble. And there will be consequences. That's the bad news. Now, let me give you the good news. God will back away from our lives when we live a life of sin. But he does not abandon us. If you know Christ, you've been set apart for him. He will not abandon you. No one can snatch you out of his hand. 
He may back away, but he will not abandon you. And if you will turn your heart back to him, your life back to him, repent to him, turn away. Whatever that is in your life, you say, God, I see it and I don't want that. I repent and I turn to you and you turn your face back to him. And God will restore, begin to restore that relationship. For some today, God's saying, you need to do that. You've been chasing that. God says, you need to repent and turn back to me. One more thing I want you to not miss in this. You remember last week at Easter, I made a comment. I said, when we read the Bible, we should read it to look for Jesus on every page of the Bible. Remember that? He's in the story. And and I just kind of went through it quickly, but let me just mention it in closing. Do you remember when the people of Judah come and they tie Samson up? This is his own people. Here comes the deliverer that God sends and his own people tie him up and hand him over to the enemy, the Philistines. You know what that is? That's pointing to a time in the future then when God would send a deliverer, the Messiah, Jesus. And his own people, it says he, Scripture says he came into his own and his own received him not. And they handed him over to be crucified. Our deliverer was handed over to the enemy and he was beaten and crucified and put on a cross and died there and God raised him from the dead. So you and I, when we look for that, can know that we turn back to him and he's paid a price for that so you and I can be restored and have a relationship with him. Today, some of you that know Christ need to turn away and turn your hearts back to him and come home to him. Others of you maybe have never come to Christ. He came and he died for you so you could have a relationship with him and know him and have real life in him. And he invites you to be a part of that relationship. He is a wonderful God of mercy. We sang about it earlier, it's true. His mercy's more. And he will make you right with him if you'll turn your heart to him.